what's missing from community energy planning today? It's simple, community voices. As Dara introduced me, he explained that I've had a varied background, so I've looked at the issue of community energy planning in lots of different ways, as an engineer, as an architect, and now as a social scientist. And what I've come to realise, and what I've come here to talk to all of you about today, is that communities and individuals within communities are in fact experts in their energy needs. I've also realised that integrating social science into community energy planning can allow communities, through sharing their stories, to play an important role in planning for their energy future. Now, this is so, no simple task, because integrating social science into energy planning is very difficult. Um, and this is because, as social scientists, we don't just construct or recount stories. We try to learn from stories that are shared with us to contribute to a better world. And this is something that is very challenging and time-consuming, because we have to spend time meeting with people, listening to their stories, and then creating a narrative for a community. But what's so beneficial about including social science into community energy planning is that it gives a broader context to the, to the issue and also can help communities' voices be heard. And this realisation came about because of a small island, a group of people on a small island on the edge of Europe. So this group of people very kindly offered to help me with my PhD research in GMIT. And they were also a very ambitious group of people, and they wanted to prove that they could plan for their energy future too. So this research was undertaken in Inishir Island, uh, which is an island of 280 people. And this talk won't just recount the process of the research, which most academics tend to do, but I'll also talk about the lessons that I learned, I'll talk about the stories that were shared with me, the people that I met, but more importantly, how together we actually constructed a vision for their energy future. So communities and individuals within communities, through sharing their stories, through sharing their visions for the, lives, the kind of lives they want to lead, can actually contribute effectively to designing their own energy futures. And at the moment, when most of us and most of you go to think about community energy planning, we think about experts as being those people with technical expertise. So, for example, engineers or architects. But the idea I've come here to, to talk to you about today is that we should really redefine how we... De really rethink how we define the energy expert and begin to acknowledge that people like you and people like in, within communities are actually experts in what they need, because they're experts in how they live their lives. So for anyone who has read Malcolm, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, when referencing an old Aaron, Anders Ericsson fable, he talks about how it takes about 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. So if you think about that, that means that you're working for 40 hours a week, 2,000 hours a year, that's about five years training in something. But then if you think about living within a community, effectively, when you've spent a little over a year living in a community, you're pretty much an expert in that community. You're an expert in its networks, in its organizations, and as well with, it, with how the individuals in that community live their lives. So having looked at this issue in many different ways over the years, and finally arriving at social science as the answer, um, it wasn't until meeting the participants of the study in Inish year and listening to all of their stories on how they used energy that I began to realize that no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what discipline you're in, we're all people and we all understand energy very differently. And this depends on our lives and where we stand in relation to it as well. So, again, the stories that were shared with me helped me to realize that energy is a function of who we are and how we live our lives, that everyone can talk about energy, and that in order to do effective community energy planning, we must not alone understand energy, but we must understand individuals, we must understand what shapes us, we must understand the communities that we're a part of, we must understand the ties that bond us all together and the stories that mold us. So, and also to understand that we can all talk about energy. We might not know the jargon, but when we talk about the things that we do every day, we're effectively talking about how we use energy. 
And this is nowhere more evident than somewhere like in an island community where their unique landscape and geographic isolation means that they use energy in very different ways than mainland communities. So that was the reason why Inishir Island was chosen as a case study for this study. Um, because from a social scientific perspective, they had a very unique landscape. And as well, all of the energy that was used on the island was imported, so that could be easily, me easily measured as well. And more importantly, it was the community themselves. So Inishir is an Irish-speaking island, but not alone that, they're very proactive when it comes to their energy planning. So, for example, in this study, the participants that took part and volunteered and willingly volunteered to take part in the study represented almost 30% of the island's population. So that really reflects how important to them securing their energy future was. So, in order for the process of community energy planning to be co-creative, which meant that the community she and I worked together as equals, it was important that I wore all of my hats, my transdisciplinary hats. So the architect hat, the engineer hat, and as well the social scientist. And this was done so that the conversations that we had could be natural, that they could flow between the different topics of energy planning quite easily. And it might seem like something natural to you guys, but in community energy planning, this is really rare. Because these kind of studies are normally engineering-based, and social science is very often omitted as well. And to my knowledge, there's been no other studies, mixed method studies similar to this undertaken. And that's because community energy planning and integrating into this is time consuming. And most of the work in this actual study involved the social scientific aspects of the study. So I met with people, I visited their homes, I met my families, their families. I spent hours listening to their stories and listening to their perceptions on, on how island life impacts how they use energy. And they also explained to me that they felt their life would be an awful lot better if this, was inf if this influenced their energy plan. Um, and it has to be remembered that months were spent gathering these data, months were spent speaking to these people, and also months were spent analysing the data as well in order to create a narrative for the community and how they use energy. Um, Obviously, it was an, uh, an energy plan, so it was important to include engineering techniques as well. So this is an example, a sketch of what um, their yearly electricity demand profile looks like. So looking at this, you can see that during the summer months in the middle, that there's huge peaks in energy demand. Um, so if you were to look at this without any understanding of the context to this, this, the broader context of it, you might question what's happening. But because of the hour of the months of interviews that were undertaken, I knew that this was because of the high influx of tours into the island in the summer months. Up to 100,000 people can visit in a year every year. So imagine it goes from a population of 280 up to, up to 5,000 a day, for example. And this is an example of information and context to some technical data that might not be understood if it wasn't for including the community's knowledge into the process. And it's important to remember as well that as a technical expert or an outsider coming into a community, there's always going to be knowledge that's beyond your grasp. That if you come and you visit a community for a short period of time and you insert yourself into that community, that's not enough to understand the real needs of that community and there will always be local knowledge beyond your grasp. And this was reflective in many of the stories that the participants shared with me. So I spent a, long t a lot of time out there when I was doing my PhD, and I really began to realise how important their link to mainland Ireland was, and how important the boat was, which seems like something you might not consider. There's only a couple of boats that leave every day, and if you miss that boat, you might miss a day in work on the mainland, you might miss being able to get in to get your shopping, you might miss your doctor's appointment. Um, and this meant that the community had to organise themselves an awful lot better, because if you miss that boat, you're in trouble. And this, lots of the participants spoke about this, but one participant in, in particular said that when she moved to the island, she was 30 and she got married. Um, and when she moved there, it was very difficult for her, because the ferry only came twice a day. And she said she realised that living on an island, you have to organise yourself a lot better, and she said that was the biggest difference. And another thing about the community in Inishir is that they're very proactive, they're very engaged, and they're very ambitious. Um, but they're also very honest. And this 
came across several times, and they were really open about sharing their ideas for their energy future. But they're also willing to be very honest, even if you, something is a research you didn't necessarily want to hear. And several of them spoke about island life and how it's really difficult for experts to fully understand. And one of them in particular said to me, I don't care how many masters or PhDs you have, you've really got to live here to understand. And other participants also spoke about this reliance on that connection to mainland Ireland and how that impacted how they used energy, how they thought about energy, but also how they thought about other resources. It's difficult for un us to understand that if there's going to be bad weather for a while, that might actually mean that you can't get your coal, or you can't get your bread, or you can't get the food that you need. So lots of the participants spoke about how they used what they called backup plans. Um, and several of them spoke about how they had more than one freezer. I thought this was really odd, like why does everyone have three freezers? Um, and it was only after discussing it with them that they explained that, well, what they do is they tend to stock up on food for up to 10 weeks in advance, which seemed crazy to me, but they explained then that there's some times in the summer where you, you're busy or you might miss the boat or there might be inclement weather and they can't get out to get their new food stocks. Um, and this also impacted the kind of technologies that they chose to put into their homes. So, for example, one of the participants said that lots of people have several different ways of heating their water. She said that lots of people have, the, have um, oil, and they also have immersion, just in case the oil goes. And then other people often have a fire with a back burner as well, just to be sure, to be sure. Um, and this also impacted choices and decisions and perceptions of new technologies, um, particularly when it came to transport. So, for example, there had been a study on the, uh, a pilot on the island for electric cars, and it seemed like this would be the perfect location for electric cars because of the short distances. But the reality of the electric car wasn't very successful there, according to the participants, because they felt it didn't meet their needs. I mean, they tend to carry bulk goods down from the ferry, and as well, if the cars broke down, there was nobody on the island with the skills to fix them. And one of the participants spoke about this, saying that a lot of people on the island tend to buy the old cars because we prefer them. He said, at least with the older models, you can nearly hit them with a hammer. He spoke about how with the newer models, it's pretty much a laptop you need. So having spent months gathering this data, months analysing this data, a narrative was developed for the community for what they might actually need from an energy plan. And then in order for this to inform the technical side of the study, um, a, a, a series of, car of desired characteristics for what they might need from an energy plan was developed. And these, there were several of these, but these are a snippet of some of them, ranging from the communities can fix technologies themselves to a desire from energy independence, which is quite understandable when you think of their reliance on mainland Ireland. Um, so the end of this study was, it was considered to be a relatively successful study, because at the end of it, the participants themselves stated that they had enjoyed the process, that they had felt like their ideas and their contributions had been acknowledged and listened to, and also a series of different technical plans were developed. The community and I worship, workshopped on these together, and they selected one for future work as well, which they said they were quite happy with. So having completed that research, it was time to move on to the next phase of my career. So I'm currently working as a postdoc researcher in NUI Galway on the Energize project. Um, and what's so interesting about this project is it's looking at similar topics, looking at how culture and social um, influences impact our energy use, and it's doing this across Europe, which is fascinating. So this project argues that cultural change has an influence on energy use as well. But in terms of community energy planning, how does this research and the research in the PhD actually impact on us? And what lessons have I learned? Well, one of the main lessons I've learned is that it's important for us, no matter, it's important for us to break down the, bar the boundaries between identities, between disciplines, between communities, and between experts. Doing that can open up a dialogue that can reveal the capacity of communities to engage in planning for their future. It's important to us to acknowledge that communities do have valuable knowledge. And what can you do to change the future of community energy planning? Well, what you can do is you can get involved in planning for your community's energy future. 
Um, you can know that your knowledge is valuable and what you have to say can make a difference. You can believe that you are the experts in your energy needs in your lives. And you can also believe that communities can have a voice in planning for your energy future and you can make your voices heard. Thank you.